Good morning and happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter, it's good to see you. Hey, we're gonna celebrate today the most important day in history, the most important day of our faith. You know, on Friday we remembered that Jesus went and he died for us, but today we're celebrating that he rose again, amen? And Matthew, it says they came to the tomb and the, the angel said, there is no one here for he is risen. Everybody say, he is risen. Amen. And we can too. There's life in him this morning. Amen. Come on. Let's worship together. We'll sing this. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures, I tried to hide. The shakings and told on men, no choice but to break. The blood set us free, ran down Jesus' face, and the devil and his demons shook a fear and were afraid. The glory set us free on the glorious day. The Lord is not here, he's not here, he is raised. Victory on the cross, the Lamb of God made a way. He is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy to be praised. The gospel of the world, he set his son for you and me, and whom the sun sets free, is free indeed. Death, where's your hold? Death, where's your sting? Death, you have lost. Jesus is king. Come, all who thirst, come to Jesus Christ, come to the cross, receive eternal life. I thank you for what you did for me. You saved my soul on the tree of Calvary. I'm forever changed because you took my sin away. Ain't changed, you never change. You're perfect in all your ways. As long as I live, I'll never forget the day. Because when you call down my name. Today we gather with millions all over the earth 
to honor and to celebrate the resurrection of our King, Jesus Christ. Come on, give God a shout of praise. Because over 2,000 years ago, that stone was rolled away. The tomb was found empty. Death could not hold him. The grave could not contain him. Where is he, church? He is risen, come on. He's so worthy. And can you just imagine, for just a second, can you just imagine what heaven must look like right now? But for just a moment, can we grab heaven's attention down here in Victoria, Texas, and just shout, thank you, Jesus. Come on, just shout it, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, today we not only celebrate our beloved King Jesus and his resurrection, but we also celebrate that he has made a way for us to experience new life with him. And here in just a moment, we're going to witness the outward expression of that inner transformation through water baptism. And we are about to watch precious men and women and children say yes to Jesus, becoming the Lord of their lives. But before we do, we wanna show you something really quick. If you'll notice, all of these words in white are the names of all the people that we're baptizing this morning. But if you see, the red words. Just take a moment and look at those for a second. Before today, we asked them, what is it that you're wanting to bury under the water today? All of these words, pain, lies, fear, envy, addiction, greed, gossip, depression, anxiety, shame. Today, Jesus is gonna change that story. When they go under the water, all of that is gonna get washed away because of the power of the cross. That's what Jesus does. And we're about to celebrate it together this morning. So can we make some noise for all of the people that are saying yes to Jesus today? Well, good morning, Faith Family Church, and happy Easter. It's good to be with you guys today. We get the privilege of baptizing about 50 people between last service and this service today. It's amazing. As Mickey just said, there's so many awesome, unique stories with each and every baptism. But let me tell you one that's kind of close to my heart. This is my niece, Miss Ava Cabella. And on our Good Friday service, Miss Ava gave her life to Jesus, and she said, I want to be baptized Easter Sunday. So that's why we have a guest appearance here today, because he couldn't sit this one out. Well, church family, as you can imagine, this is a momentous occasion that will make this Easter one I will never forget. And that is my beautiful firstborn grandbaby, Ava, is going to be baptized and if you wonder what my shirt says, it says, there's this girl that stole my heart. She calls me Papa J. And that's how I feel about Ava. So Ava, have you asked Jesus in your heart? Okay. You want to do this real quick? Okay, based on your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now 
there is living faith. All of my hope and freedom are found in Jesus' name. Just like Lazarus, oh, you brought me back to life. No longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I've been Take all the turning, just like Lazarus. Oh, you brought me back to life. Oh, you brought me back to life. Oh, you brought me back to life. Oh, you
come on every voice we declare I've witnessed your faithfulness and I've seen you breathe life within so I'll pour out my praise again you're worthy God you're worthy of all of it your promises never fail I've got stories I live to tell so I'll pour out my praise again you're worthy God you're worthy of all of it yes, you left the throne and chose the cross laid down your life to rescue us the Savior then he's the Savior now Amen. believe in death was not the end you conquered hell so I could live resurrecting then resurrecting now come on he is a resurrected king resurrecting then resurrecting now and I witnessed your faithfulness and I've seen you breathe life within so I'll
Let's give him another shout of praise for how great he is. Well, happy Resurrection Sunday this morning to you. It is an awesome, awesome honor to get to celebrate the raising of our Savior this morning. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Well, we have a great service ahead. Before we continue on, we're going to dismiss our awesome J High students to their service. For the rest of us, why don't you greet someone? Tell them how wonderful it is to see them in God's house. Tell them Happy Easter, and you guys can be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Great to worship with you on this beautiful Easter morning. How many believe we have a reason to celebrate this morning? Amen. So great to see you. If you're worshiping with us this morning and are new to Faith Family, I want to take just a second and welcome you. We're so happy to have you with us. 
really always blessed and honored when people take time out of their week to come and be in service. So thank you for being here. We hope you feel welcome and at home today. And our prayer is that we can cheer you on in your journey with God wherever you may be this morning. You know, Jesus said in one of the gospels, he said, because I live, you can live too. And that, that word uh, live is to live spiritually. It's an inner connection to God that causes us to have life, a relationship with him that causes our life to thrive from the inside out. And so that's what we have loved helping people do for the last three decades at Faith Family Church, helping them not just get to, to know about God, but really getting to know God, to have a relationship with him and to understand the life that he's created us to live as believers. So, you know, we'd love to be an encouragement to you today. There's an orange card in the, in the uh, seat back for you. It's a guest card. You could fill that out and it helps us get to know a little bit about you, know the best way that we can serve you here at Faith Family. If we can help you get connected, find friends so that you're growing in your walk with the Lord and you're, you know, you're, you're living a life that makes a difference. How many of you want to live a life that makes a difference, right? Makes heaven happy when we get there, right? So, or there's, if you don't want to do the card, there's a QR uh, code on the seat back that you can scan and a link on the screen. All those ways will help us get connected. Then on your way out, we have a welcome hub. Everybody say welcome. Welcome Hub, you can stop by there and uh, we can, uh, we have a gift for you and a team there that can answer any questions that you have. If you do fill the card out, please put it on the information wall uh, as you go out today. They're at your exit. So thank you for being here. Faith Family, can we give our guests a hand and welcome them this morning? Well, as we get ready to take our tithes and offerings for God's work, I want to thank you, Faith Family, for uh, helping make disciples week in and week out for over 30 plus years. Thank you. Turn to your neighbor and say, thank you. You know, one of the last things that Jesus told his disciples, his followers, before he left the earth, he says, go into all the world and make disciples. It wasn't a suggestion by Jesus, it was a commission. And you've been a part of helping us make disciples through all the years. You know, with our services every week, we're making disciples in three of our campuses. How many of you know we have three, uh, three more Faith Family Church campuses that's having tr that, are, that are having church this morning? That's awesome. Not only through our services, but through our small groups, through our uh, our celebration. Celebrate Recovery that meets here every week. We're seeing lives change there through our student ministry, through our, our kids' ministry. They're learning to get to know God, to love God in a very special way. Not only do we get to bless our community and help make disciples here, but beyond the borders. How I many of you know uh, in India we're making a difference in some of the darkest places of the world? Amen. Jim and I just recently got back from India where we dedicated our second House of Palms campus. And that's a, a, a a place where uh, 500 years there's been a tradition of prostitution among the people. But they're finding out that Jesus has a better way. He's got a beautiful life, a beautiful future for them. Actually, there were six girls from the House of Palms that are now studying to be pharmacists, nurses, um, stewardesses. And so that's just a, a, an incredible thing, isn't it? Amen. From prostitution to that, that's a good thing. And Faith Family, it wouldn't be happening without you, your generosities, your prayers, your service, and your resources that you give to God to keep his work moving forward. So let's, let's prepare to give this morning. We are so grateful for you. Turn to your neighbor and say thank you. have your gift, why don't you take, uh, whether it's your phone or your envelope, put your hand on it. Let's bless it this morning. Father, we're so grateful to know you and to be part of a community of faith where we're being loved, supported, where we're learning truth. Jesus, you said it's the truth that we know that makes us free. Thank you for all the ways you're be bringing freedom to our lives. God, you're causing us to flourish. Lord, I know you're so blessed by people who consistently, faithfully give of their time, talent, and resources to make a difference for you. Lord, you gave us your best, and we want to give you our best this morning. So we give with happy hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, welcome to church and thanks for coming. 
People have different reasons for coming to church. Some are trying something new, others come regularly, maybe you got dragged in by a loved one, or tricked into coming by a friend. I'm sorry, this isn't your favorite brunch place, but there's good coffee after service. Anyway, however you got here, we're so glad that you did. You may be wondering, why do people do all this? The worship, the singing, the talks, and what makes church different than any other gathering like a book club or a fan club? That's a really good question. Actually, people from thousands of years ago asked it too. They argued about whether Jesus was different from any other revolutionary. A wise government official said in a paraphrase, there have been a lot of movements in the world and if Christianity is just another fad, it'll die out. But guess what? It never did. You may say, yeah, but neither did Hinduism or other religions, and that's true. But Christianity is the only religion whose leader, Jesus, fulfilled every claim he ever made. He fulfilled over 300 predictions that were written about his life before he ever lived. If somebody predicted every Super Bowl winner and the score for the last 50 years, you'd probably listen, right? I would too. So back to the question, what makes a gathering like this any different from clubs or groups? Well, we believe that church is different because Jesus is different. He lived up to every claim he ever made and his existence is undisputed by Christian and non-Christian historians. His name is in encyclopedias with people like Julius Caesar and Abraham Lincoln. But he wasn't just different because he was credible. He was different because he genuinely loved people. Unlike other gods, Jesus didn't ask crowds to sacrifice themselves to earn his good graces. Actually, he sacrificed himself so the world could have a grace that we could never earn. He left power to love people, not the other way around. He came to serve rather than be served, and his life echoes love, truth, and purpose. As his followers, he's asked us to come gather like this and celebrate him, to love each other, and to learn to love like he did. We do not always do it perfectly, and we always have more to learn. But we believe this gathering is different because Jesus is different. Every ministry from kids, teens, young adults, to women, men, elderly, those in prison or in need across the world, every single ministry exists so that anyone and everyone can know Him. Well, hey, we hope this gives answers to what you experienced today, to the meaning behind the standing, the clapping, the singing, the teaching. And we hope you feel welcome here too, because you are, no matter your past. We're here for you, and we want your life to be filled with joy. Thanks for being here, and happy Easter. In a culture that prizes success and status, join us as we learn why character counts, maybe more than we think. Well, good morning, everybody. How many of you are grateful? For, yeah, yeah. What a great way to start my Easter day, right? But how many of you are grateful for the incredible certainty and the incomparable gratefulness you have in your heart because he is risen this morning, right? When you think about heaven and eternity and when you see what he can do in people's hearts and lives, it's so easy to be filled with joy. And I want to start just by thanking you this morning for being here. You know, it means so much to celebrate the most momentous occasion in the history of the world 
with people who are incredibly beloved in your heart. So thank you for being here. This is the 35th Easter that Tamara and I are celebrating with a, a few people in this room. And when we talked about it the other night, and as we were just reflected on what God's done over the years, we just want to thank you for how your love and obedience for God has shown us why God treasures the togetherness of his family so much. I think it's expressed perfectly in Psalm 14, 5, where when talking about demonic power that's behind all the hurt, all the pain, all the suffering in the world, the Bible says this, they are overwhelmed with grief. How many of you are glad we have power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us because of what Jesus has done, amen? But then the next statement says this, for God is present in the company of the righteous. And God is present in a way that he's not present when we don't understand our call to love one another and to serve one another the way that Jesus called us to love one another and to serve one another. When, when the church lives with God present, listen, that's where healing begins to happen. That's where legacies of blessing are birthed in families. That's where friendships see things happen that are so amazing. And really, one of my greatest joys as pastor is just to see how family and friend groups come together, and as they honor Jesus, and as they love and serve each other, he does such incredible things. And that's the joy God wants for your family. I want to encourage you in that. Uh, by the way, this isn't my main sermon. I'm just serving you an appetizer, all right? before we get to the main sermon. But I remember Emily's senior year, she qualified for two events in the state track meet. And the first one was the 800, and man, she ran with everything she had, but she came in fourth and she didn't place. And she really, really wanted to get first place, so she was disappointed. And I remember afterwards, we were in a restaurant and we were, you know, talking about maybe some things that she could have done different in how she ran the race. And I'm sure she was thinking about different, maybe training methods, maybe she could have embraced. But then we realized, you know, we can't do anything about that. Let's just focus on right now and what can happen right now. And words were spoken that encouraged her heart and, you know, food was fed to her that refreshed her body. And uh, she went out and the two mile was her final event. And I'll never forget, it was the last lap, and she was about 70 yards behind, and that little girl started kicking, and her blonde hair started blowing in the wind. And 2,000 people stood up and started screaming as she was closing in on the front runner. Nobody screaming louder than her mother. I'm glad I can still hear after the way Tamara screamed. And then she ran. And it was a photo finish. Literally, the judges had to look at the camera at Baylor's track to see who won. And you know what? She got the gold medal. She won by a nose. And I told her if she had her daddy's nose, she would have won by more. But God wants those kind of memories. He wants those kind of moments in our family. And how many of you know with Jesus leading the way, we can have those kind of memories, right? If we honor him in the present... He's going to do such amazing things. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for what we celebrate today. Your compassion, your, your purpose, your grit. And Lord, most of all, your power that's bigger than what the enemy's up to in our world. Lord, help us experience it today so we rise up into the things you're dreaming about in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... I really enjoy looking at beautiful pieces of art. My missionary uh, travels have given me the opportunity to see artwork that's not just beautiful, but it's legendary. A lot of us have seen the print, for instance, of, Rem of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. And uh, this is the painting of it. It's on uh, the monastery, at, uh, a Dominican monastery in Italy. And when I first looked at that painting, I thought, man, it is so beautiful. And then I learned two facts that really surprised me. Number one, did you know it took him three years to paint that picture? And of course, some of it's because it's so big. It's 15 feet tall by 30 feet wide 
provide, and so that would take you, you know, a good amount of time. But the second thing I learned is that he literally got a person to pose for every single one of the people that he painted as a disciple. So he had to look for people. He had, you know, to check a lot of people out. He had to recruit them. And then they posed, and literally he painted each one of their faces. So you could, could you imagine if you grew up in that town, you said, man, I can't believe he made Uncle Luigi into John. And how did Uncle D uh, Dominic become Judas? I mean, I can't believe he's going to be in that wall forever. But listen, folks, it, it takes time sometimes for masterpieces to be created. And, and here's another interesting fact about that painting, and that is it, it said that the first person that he painted was Jesus. And he looked for somebody who was so kind, so pure, who looked like sin had never hardly affected their life, and he painted the face of Jesus. Then the last person that he painted was Judas. And for Judas, he went into a prison, and he looked for somebody whose face was so hardened that this person looked like they could betray their very best friend. And it's said that whenever he got done painting Judas and they were taking him back to prison, that Judas said to Da Vinci, hey, don't you recognize me? And Da Vinci said, no, I don't recognize you. Why? He said, well, three years ago, you painted me as Jesus, and now today, you're painting me as Judas. And I don't know about that, but can I tell you what I do know? I can tell you that I know that I've seen sin ruin a lot of great plans that God had for people's lives. And I've seen uh, sin ruin the best version of people that God wanted to bring out of them. But the good news is I've also seen that there's a power that can restore. There's a power that can redeem. There's a power that can make beautiful, and it's the power of Jesus Christ. Paul spoke about this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, when he said, we are God's masterpiece. And he said, he's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that God planned for us long ago. You know, I can still remember the first time I heard that scripture read, the first time I heard that scripture taught on. I was in a Sunday night Vesper service in the college that I attended. And I remember walking back to the athletic dorm at the university where I stayed. And I thought, you know what, Lord, if you see beauty that you want to bring out of my life that I can't see and I could never bring out of my life, I want to do whatever's necessary, Lord, so that you can do what you're dreaming about doing with my life. And I can tell you 45 years later that, you know, I'm not everything I wish I was as a person, but I do have the joy of seeing beauty that God brought out in my life that I couldn't see, I could have never developed without a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what Mark's gospel is going to talk to us about today. It's interesting when you read Mark's gospel that really it's in three sections when he talks about the resurrection. And in the first eight verses, he talks about the event. He talks about Jesus winning the victory over death, hell, and the grave. But then in the next part, in the next six verses, he talks about how even though Jesus won the victory, his followers were still dealing with the same things they dealt with in their life. And we see the determination of Jesus, the tenacity of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, Jesus. And we see that Jesus wasn't content for people he loved not to live in victory. And then he ends this particular gospel by talking about how Jesus wants us as believers to then carry this same victory into the lives of everybody who's in our world. And I love how God inspired the four gospels because in the four gospels we get such a different view of the beauty and majesty of Jesus based on the personality of the author. For instance, whenever Matthew wrote his gospel, you know, Matthew's kind of in the face of the religious crowd. He starts it out with the genealogy, and he says, you know what? You can think whatever you want to think about Jesus, but he fulfilled 300 pre-predicted uh, events in his life, and he's the Messiah God promised us long ago, and we need to deal with that fact. And then he's the only one that talks about how there was this 
great earthquake whenever Jesus breathed his last breath. And whenever that earthquake happened, this curtain that symbolized that man needs forgiven of sin to experience God right, that curtain was torn from top to bottom whenever Jesus died. And it's as if Matthew is saying to us, man, this has to shake us up, man. You're not saved just because you know about God, but how many of you know when you know Jesus, he's going to save your life because he has so much life on the inside of him, right? And then we come to Luke's gospel, and I love Luke's gospel because it's so detailed. It, 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 it documents the story of Jesus, and he says to us, now I'm going to give you infallible proof about Jesus you could never deny. But he also get, goes into such great detail. So when I read Luke's gospel, I'm just astonished at how merciful Jesus was, that he was sympathetic to people, whether they were the worst person who made all kinds of poor choices or whether they were a person who had a lot of things done to them and they really needed help. He was so wise. When I read the Gospel of Luke, I think, you know, whatever I'm still working on, Jesus has enough wisdom. If I honor it, he's going to work things out. Whenever I read about how Jesus prayed so much and had such an incredible supernatural anointing on his life, when I read Luke's Gospel, I want to be a person of prayer. And then we come to John's gospel, and it's easy for me to see that John was the little brother of James, and also he was the youngest of the disciples because the brother needed help. There's just no other way to say this. When he says of himself, I'm the disciple Jesus loved. How many of you know somebody should smack somebody for saying that, right? Because he loves all of us. And then it gets even worse when he describes the resurrection account and how the women told he and Peter that Jesus' body wasn't in the grave. He said, Peter and I took off running for the tomb, and I want you to know, I outran Peter. Now, how many of you know, when, when that guy got to heaven, I bet he got a noogie whenever he got to heaven. If, if you don't know what a noogie is, it's when your older brother takes his knuckles and he applies pressure on your head because he's saying there's something stupid in there and somebody has to do something about it. But then we come to Mark's gospel, which we're going to talk about today. Day. And here's what scholars have written about Mark's gospel, that the three most obvious characteristics of Mark's gospel are compactness and vividness and orderliness. In other words, in the gospel of Mark, we have the shortest of the four gospels. We also have very vivid description of the things that happened, and you can feel the emotion of Mark, not just the facts of what happened, but what Mark was feeling as all these events were happening wherever Jesus went. And then it's orderly. It calls us to something very important. And I'm only going to be able to preach on two out of three things this morning because I don't want your brisket to burn, okay? But, but basically, Mark talked about three, and he said, first of all, he said the church needs to celebrate the victory that Jesus gave us in a big way. And I'm going to talk about that event. Number two, he said, you need to celebrate victory in your life. You need to celebrate the beauty that God wants to bring forth in your life. And he shows us the reason why it's kept from us, even though God wants it for us so bad. And then he says, it's the people who experience Jesus, who now have the power to express Jesus to a world that needs him so bad. And in the second century, one of our church fathers said that it was Peter who preached these stories that Mark wrote, and that you can see Peter in the writings of Mark. His name was Irenaeus, and literally you do, that if you study Peter's life, he was the kind of guy that when he felt something, he said it. When he was, you know, in a room, if something happened and he felt it, he said it. Sometimes it wasn't the best thing to say. Sometimes it was a great thing to say. But Peter was a guy that was kind of simple, cared about what mattered, and he said what mattered. In fact, I love what he wrote in this epistle that described himself in 2 Peter. He said, you know, our dear brother Paul wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him, and he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters, but his letters contain 
some things that are really hard to understand. Now that was Paul, and God made us all unique and different. Some of us, we process things so much, everybody falls asleep while we're still processing them whenever we talk. Others of us, we speak out of deep feeling, and we speak quickly. But when we read this today, I reference that because I want you to feel the kind of feeling that Jesus has in his heart for the things that have happened to you. I want you to feel the kind of feeling he has in his heart for what he wants to do in your life because that's really what the gospel of Mark is all about. And here are the questions that Mark wants us to ask ourselves. Number one, Am I only celebrating Jesus' victory over sin, death, and hell today? Because how many of you know, if that's all you celebrate, man, that's awesome. Because how many of you are glad this morning? There's some people you love, and they're not alive anymore. But you know, they're not in your past. They're in your future. Because Jesus said, because I live, you're going to live too. And you're going to spend an eternity with me. Amen? Jesus' victory over death and the grave and hell should be celebrated great in the church. But here's the second question we're going to focus on, and that is, am I celebrating my victory over those things that I have because of the lordship of Jesus Christ in my life? Because let's face it, most Easter productions don't do a good job of this. Most Easter productions, basically, Jesus pops out of the tomb, and we all start clapping for Jesus because he overcame death, hell, and the grave. And if you're a modern-day evangelical, everybody starts singing, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive and unforgiven, heaven's gates are open wide. If you're a traditional evangelical, you may have sung, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone. Or if you were Catholic like me, we sang, Christ our Lord is risen today, hallelujah. Yeah, right? And we celebrated this great victory that Jesus accomplished. But Mark writes about that victory, but he writes about more. So let's go through the story. First of all, in verse 1, it says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they may go to anoint Jesus' body. So the first thing we learn is that the original Spice Girls came from the Bible, right? <laughs> and it says very early on the first day of the week, just after Sunday, Sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now, this stone weighed 4,000 pounds, y'all, so two women, as spirited as, as I'm sure these two women were, were not going to move the tomb from the front of Jesus' grave, but two angels moved it, not so that they could, you know, so that Jesus could get out of his grave, but they moved it so they could go in and see that the miracle Jesus promised to be been performed. And the Bible says when they looked up and they saw the stone had been rolled away, they entered the tomb and they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. And the angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. He's been crucified, but he's risen. He's not here. Look at the place where they laid him. Now, that's the first victory that we celebrate on Easter. But then John goes into the second victory that we celebrate, and he teaches us three things. Number one, he teaches us that if we're going to have victory in our life, powders need to turn into people who start celebrating what God promised to do in our life. The next verse says that Jesus rose early on that that first day, resurrection day, and he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. I don't know what those demons were. Maybe they were anxiety. Maybe they were bitterness. Maybe they were depression. Maybe she'd been abused as a little girl, and she had a lot of issues that she was dealing with in her heart. But I know that Mark is making it clear to us that Mary had these issues. She wasn't getting past in spite of the fact that God was a God who clearly demonstrated himself as a God who fulfilled promises. And Mark goes on to say in the next verse, he said that after Mary had Jesus appear to her, that she went back to the other people. And the Bible says they were all weeping as well. And they didn't believe what happened. And it just tells us that even though we are celebrating the first victory, which is Jesus' death on the cross, it's so easy for us at times to say, what's going on in my heart is bigger 
than what happened on the cross. What's going on in my heart is still bigger than what happened in the tomb that day. And Jesus would say, no, it's not bigger. I need you to get over the pouting so I can bring forth what I promised you that I would do in your life. Amen? John's account gives us the most detailed description. He says in verse 11 of John 20 that Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And the angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? And listen to what she said. She said, they've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they put him. And at this she turned and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize it was Jesus. Now I want you to mark that phrase because we're going to hear it again later in this message that Jesus for some reason chose to appear in a form that they didn't totally recognize whenever he came to them. And then notice, whenever she looked around, the Bible says she saw Jesus. And notice Jesus asked her the very same question that the angel asked her. Jesus said, woman, why are you crying? What are you looking for? Do you know what Jesus was saying? He was saying, listen, what are you looking for in the resurrection? Because if you're pouting, there's something I want you to see that's going to change everything about your life. And that is, I want you to see that there's a God who loves you. There's a God who has power over the power of sin. There's a God who fulfills everything that he promised. It said so well in Romans chapter 8, when Paul said, what can separate me from the love of God? Trouble that I don't know how to take on. Hardship I've been through, I don't know how to handle. Listen, I've learned a great reality. And that is, I can be more than a conqueror through Christ who loved me. Can you say amen? Jesus rose from the dead and he can help me rise up above it. But you notice that first, God wanted to help the powders say, there's something about the resurrection I need to embrace that's going to cause God to fulfill his promises in my life. And then there was a second group of people that Jesus appeared to. It's in verse 12. And it says, after appearing to Mary Magdalene, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. And this is talking about a man named Cleopas, who is also called Alpheus and also called Clopas at times in the Bible. And he was a very dedicated, very mature disciple of Jesus, but he had gotten highly discouraged. If you want to know how powerful he was as a person, one of his children was one of the 12. His son James, not James the the brother of John the Apostle, but the one called James the Less in Scripture was the son of Cleopas. Also, his wife Mary was so dedicated and devoted to Jesus that when he was hanging on the cross and being crucified, she boldly stood there and she poured out her love on Jesus because they knew who he was. But sometimes even dedicated, mature Christians get discouraged. And I want you to notice what Jesus did. It said best in Luke's gospel, which is very, very descriptive. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. It was seven miles northwest of Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but again, they were kept from recognizing him. Now, why were they kept from recognizing him? I believe it's because, listen, you can always find God, but you're going to have to seek him. He's not going to force himself on you. He's a gentleman. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, God just isn't speaking to me. And you know what I do just because I'm a bit ornery as a pastor? I take my Bible and I do this and I say, he's speaking to you right now. These words right here, they will heal you and they'll deliver deliver you from all of your destruction. Can somebody give me a good amen? And here's the reality. If you will read God, you'll have no trouble hearing God in your life. But let me tell you, the devil is deceptive. And you've got to watch whenever the talking and the pillow talk starts happening because he's very good at knowing your emotion. And he's very good at knowing how to get you off track in life. And so Jesus came in to these discouraged disciples who needed a course correction. And verse 17 says that Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? 
And they stood still with their faces downcast. Can I tell you something I wish I learned earlier than I did? And that is, there's only one emotion that I should allow in my heart. And it's the emotion of joy. Because any other emotion tells me the devil's playing with my heart. He's trying to tell me I can't get past this difficulty. He's trying to tell me what he's doing is bigger than what God's doing in my life. But when I get into joy, I realize there's a God who not only fulfilled his promise in that image empty tomb years ago how many of you are glad we have a God who won't let us have an empty life who'll have let us have an abundant life because of who Jesus is hey amen and, and here it goes and, and Jesus says why are you downcast and they say well didn't you hear about Jesus of Nazareth he was a prophet powerful in word and deed and the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him but we hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. And some of the women amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb, and they found it was just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. Now, do you see how crazy discouragement is? Basically, they said, Jesus did everything he promised us he would do. We're sitting here discouraged, and they went to the tomb, and the angels told us he's alive. The women said he's not there, but we're still living here in our discouragement. And can I tell you something? Before discouragement lifts off your life, lifts off your family, before God bursts a new beginning and a legacy of blessing, you never want to miss. Because listen, the most beautiful work of art I've never seen isn't hanging in a museum somewhere. The most beautiful works of art I've ever seen are in front of me this morning it's kids whose dad walked away and they said Jesus is going to lift me up above that it's two dysfunctional people who came together in marriage they said Jesus is going to lift us up above that it's people who were fighting addictions and they fell down but they didn't give up but they let the mercy and the grace of God heal them whenever people looked at him and said there's no way and that's what this is about Jesus wants to birth victory in our lives how determined he was not just to rise from the dead but to find Mary who let the demonic power back in her heart and she was so depressed and so discouraged to find these two mature disciples who somehow got confused and they needed a course correction you know a number of people have sent me messages this week about how in our nation you know powerful people are making a big deal how out of how this is to be like the transgender day of visibility and uh, they, they're not talking about Easter they're talking about you know that and they say pastor what do you think about that can I tell you what I think I think that the America that I was raised in is very different than the America I'm pastoring in right now and we live in a very confused society and you know what God wants from his church he told us in Micah 6 8 he said I've told you oh man what's good and what the Lord requires of you I want you to do justice I want you to stand up for what's right because what's right is what causes people to have a great life can you say amen but I don't want you just to do justice I want you to love mercy I want you to love people even more than you love truth And I want you to walk humbly with your God. Hey, I got news for you. The devil's messing, but God's going to start blessing. There's going to be a revival come to this country as the body of Christ does our part. Can you say amen? But listen, if we're honest, we all have been powders. And we need to say no pouting this Easter. Jesus, he brought victory to me. And I'm going to believe in the promises of God. We've all needed course corrections in our life. And we need to say, Jesus, I give you the right to bring a course correction in my life. And then there's a third group of people that Jesus appeared to, and it was the 11. Sadly, Judas had died at this time. He had committed suicide. But verse 14 says, later Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating, and he rebuked them. Everybody say, he rebuked them. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who'd seen him after he was risen. In other words, Jesus was saying, man, what do I have to do to get you all to believe? And I love the fact that he loved them so much, he just kept coming back to them. But can I tell you something? If you're here today and you have any unbelief about who Jesus Christ is, 
you don't have any valid reason to have any unbelief in your heart for who Jesus is. If you study the 300 predictive prophecies made about him, if you look at the miracles the Holy Spirit did to accreditate the life of Jesus, there's no doubt that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Some of us may have stubbornness in our heart. The stubbornness might come because of what happened to us, because of even what happened to us in a church. And I just want to say to you that hopefully... You have family members, and hopefully you're in a church like Faith Family where our motto is, we're not here to see through you. We want to see you through. How many of you know when you know God has great things in people's lives? You don't want to give up on the great thing. You want to see the beauty and the masterpiece be brought forth. Can you say amen? That's what Jesus calls us to. And that's why he kept coming to the powder. Kept coming to the one who needed the course correction. Kept coming to the people who were stubborn. And they had unbelief in their heart. And he helped them. And somehow Jesus changed the world through them. And listen, that's what Jesus wants to do for your family. You know, I I have a personality that I rebuke people sometimes. I rebuke them because it's just how I'm made. When I see things wrong and I want to get them right, it's just I'm the kind of guy that talks. And, uh, you know, if you're somebody who rebukes people once in a while, and by the way, the Bible says you shouldn't do it all that often. Can you say amen? But when you do it, it's because there's something inside a person's life that this one critical mistake that's being made or this one thing that we don't face, it's going to cause things not to come out as beautiful as they can come out if we don't deal with this one thing that's in this person's heart. And if you're somebody who does that, if you're a coach like I am and you deal with things, you know sometimes the whole room feels like it's against you whenever you rebuke something. But you have to rebuke it anyway. Because there's a reward on the other side if that person will forgive and believe God can heal their family. If that person will have faith even though they've failed so many times. If that person will quit thinking about the past and start thinking about what God's up to now, you know something great can happen in a family. Hey, can I tell you what my greatest joy is at Faith Family Church? I'm not looking at perfect people this morning, but I'm looking at passionate people this morning who love Jesus with all of your heart. And how many of you know because of that, you can know that your blessing will not be because you were perfect. It's because you just kept saying yes to the one who is perfect. And he brought blessing into your life. Amen. I close with this scripture. And then we're going to show you a story this morning. It's in 1 John 5, 4. And this is what it says. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Say that with me. For everyone... Now look at your neighbor and say, so what's your excuse? Would you go ahead and do that? If everyone born of God can overcome the world, then what's my excuse? And then listen to how John closes. He says, this is the victory. Everybody say, this is the victory. This is the victory that's overcome the world, even our faith. If you have faith, God has more than enough power to overcome what the enemy's up to. He has more than enough power to bring blessing and a beautiful legacy into your life and into your family's life. I want you to listen to this awesome story that that shows that so clearly this morning before we close this service. As a young boy, my father was never here. I mean, I felt like I was searching for a father and everything, drugs, my peers, I was searching in all the wrong places. Twelve years old, I first tried marijuana. It wasn't long before I caught my first crime and was arrested and went to juvenile because I was stealing to support my habit. From 17 to my early 20s, I just continued this cycle of, you know, doing drugs and partying and hanging out with the wrong people and in and out of jail. It wasn't until I was about 25 years old that I hit my rock bottom. I lost my job due to my addiction. Um, my family didn't trust me anymore. And nobody, you know, wanted me around. And I remember an uncle telling me, hey, if you ever want to get away from all this stuff, you can come see me in North Carolina. I remember being homeless for one night before I got on that bus. I was laying outside of a church. It was a Spanish church, but I went in there anyways, and uh, they were praising and worshiping, and I was just crying sitting there. 
telling God, like, please, God, just give me another chance. I know if anything can help me, it can be you. And that was a turning point for my life for the, for the best. I remember hearing about a Celebrate Recovery when I was incarcerated. It's a 12-step recovery group. I was like, man, I'm gonna go check this out. I started attending faithfully and um, it was life-changing to me. I was happy, no drugs, no alcohol, and it just felt good. It felt good inside that God gave me another chance. I was able to share my story with other people. God really put me in a position, I felt like, to be able to help others, and that just felt really good, and it felt really humbling. I come from a family of addicts, and I had no idea that I struggled myself. When we first started talking, I remember thinking how incredible that is that he had the strength to recover, that God's strength was behind that. I'd like to say we talk, uh, we followed God right away, but we didn't. We started going to bars, we started drinking again. We winded up separating. He told me that we needed to follow Christ, and we, it was the only way. Pastor Jim talks about, you know, he challenges people to give God and church a year of your life, and that, you know, you'll never go back to what you used to do, or that things won't be the same, and uh, we did that. And things have changed so much for the better. Our marriage is renewed, our marriage is reborn, our entire family is, has been baptized here and given their life to Christ and they know Jesus. To anybody that's on the fence about God, who's in, been in a bad place that thinks they can't be redeemed or just given up or wants a new hope or a new life, that it's possible, change is possible. Put God first, put Jesus first in everything you do and I promise you that it can change your life. God can restore our marriage and our relationships. Our lives. Yeah, then I know that he can do it for anybody because I never would have thought we'd be where we're at today.
says that we've been rescued from the dominion of darkness, that we've been brought into the light of Jesus, and that through him, we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins. Amen. Aren't you thankful for the forgiveness that we have this morning, for the life that we have this morning? Come on, let's sing these. Was the cross meant for me that my Hey, can we thank our artists for all the work they do? And man, they helped us worship so well this season. And then I just want to pray a prayer for you and speak a blessing over you before you go. But I want you to say this with me. I want you to say, the cross was meant for me. I'm the reason. Jesus did it. But the power is meant for me too. God wants me to have victory in my life. You see, the mercy of God is what doesn't give us what we deserve. It's why Jesus will keep coming back to us. He'll be patient with us. He'll be loving with us. He'll be sympathetic towards us. The grace of God is what won't give you your own way. Because when you've had your way for too long, you don't know how much beauty you kept from coming forth in your life. And this morning, God wants you to go forth this Easter confident that all the mercy you could ever need is yours because of the love and the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And all the grace you ever need to have a beautiful life. It's just waiting on you. And if you'll seek him, you'll find it, right? So here's what I want us to do. If we'd all bow our heads, close our eyes, and real quickly, if you say, you know, Pastor Jim, that's what I want. I want to say no to sin. I know Jesus came and he died for my sins so I wouldn't die from it. And I want to repent of it. I want to say no to it today. And I want to say yes to the mercy and to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm ready to be a Jesus follower today. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. The Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How could we not 
with how beautiful his power is. And if you're here and you say, I'm ready to call today in the name of the Lord. I'm ready to say no to sin, yes to Jesus. I'm going to count to three. And I want you to just shoot your hand up. We're going to lead you in calling on the name of the Lord at your seat. Are you ready? One, two, if it's God's turn now, three. Shoot up your hand all over this place. Awesome, 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 awesome. Thank you, ushers. Awesome. Anybody else? Just wave your hand. You say today, man, it's God's time in my life. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Way up in the risers. Way more hands than I could count or, or even see right now. So beautiful. Let me ask one more question. Is there anybody who says, you know, Pastor, I served him, but I've strayed. Or maybe you're like the one Matthew talked about. I've served him, but I, need, I needed to shake me up a little bit more. I need to give God my heart fully. If that's you, would you shoot up your hand too all over this place? You say, man, I served him, but I'm going to serve him with a new passion and a new strength and a new boldness. Awesome, all over this place, so many hands. Okay, church family, would you look up? Let's put our hand on our heart. Let's pray this together. Let's say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for coming to earth so we'd know how loved we are and how incredible God's ability to save every life truly is. Today, Lord, I say no to sin, and I receive your gift of salvation. Lord, thank you for loving me when I wasn't living right. Now help me grow into who you know I can be. And when I mess up, help me trust in your mercy and in your grace to grow a great life. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. And all God's people said, hey, let's give a big hand clap to those who just prayed. And Tamara's going to share something to be a blessing to your families real quick. Then I'm going to say the blessing. But if you prayed, I want to encourage you, man, God has a great future for you. And church is a place where he nurtures that future. So on your way out, we want to get you off to a great start. We have a gift for you. It's in a white packet on our information walls as you leave. And it is a gift, the devotional 30 days to new beginning. A couple cards that will help you connect with God and connect with great people. And then we want to encourage you to be baptized. Everybody say, believe and be baptized. Jesus said if you're serious, that's the first step. And uh, I know you're serious. We want to encourage you to do that. Tan? Great word today. Can we give him a good hand? That's such a great word. I want to thank you for joining us for today for this Easter service together. We're so glad that you were here. I want to remind you that we have some awesome photo booths out in the Connection Center. We want you to make some beautiful memories with your family uh, this Easter. I also want you to know that we'll have prayer partners. If any of you'd like prayer, they'll be down front after service. Okay, let me speak uh, God's blessing over us. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Thank you for honoring God on this day. It was great being with you. Amen.